To begin our macroeconomic history, let's start with the classical model. It dates back to the late 1700s and has its roots in the laissez-faire writings of free market economists like Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and, most importantly, Jean-Baptiste Say. These classical economists believe that the problem of unemployment was a natural part of the business cycle, that it was self-correcting, and, most important, that there was no need for the government to intervene in the free market to correct it. Between the Civil War and the Roaring Twenties, America sustained periodic booms and busts, recording no less than five official depressions. However, after every bust, the economy always bounced back, exactly as the classical economists predicted. That was true until these classical economists met their match in the Great Depression of the 1930s. With the stock market crash of 1929, the economy fell into first a recession and then a deep depression. The gross domestic product fell by almost a third, and by 1933, 25% of the workforce was unemployed. At the same time, business investment virtually disappeared from about $16 billion in 1929 to $1 billion by 1933. While President Herbert Hoover kept promising that prosperity was just around the corner, and the classical economists kept waiting for what they viewed as the inevitable recovery, two key figures walked on to the macroeconomic stage. Economist John Maynard Keynes and Hoover's presidential successor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. John Maynard Keynes flatly rejected the classical notion of a self-correcting economy and warned that patiently waiting for the eventual recovery was fruitless because, in the long run, we're all dead. Keynes believed that under certain circumstances, the economy would not naturally rebound, but simply stagnate or, even worse, fall into a death spiral. To Keynes, the only way to get the economy moving again was to prime the economic pump with increased government expenditures. Thus, the fiscal policy was born, and the Keynesian prescription became the underlying if unstated philosophy, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal. Roosevelt's ambitious public works programs in the 1930s, together with the 1940s boom of World War II, were enough to lift the American economy out of the Great Depression and up to unparalleled heights. In the early 1950s, the Keynesian prescription of large-scale government expenditures worked again this time when the heavy spending associated with the Korean War helped pull the economy out of a slump. A decade later, pure Keynesianism reached its zenith with the much-heralded Kennedy tax cut of 1964. President John F. Kennedy's Camelot, the chairman of economic advisors Walter Heller, popularized the term fine-tuning, and Heller firmly believed that through the careful mechanistic application of Keynesian principles, the nation's macroeconomy could be held very close to full employment with minimal inflation. In 1962, Heller recommended to Kennedy that the president advocate a large tax cut to stimulate the sluggish economy. The Congress eventually agreed, and this Keynesian tax cut helped make the 1960s one of the most prosperous decades in America. However, this fiscal stimulus also laid the foundation for the emergence of a new and ugly macroeconomic phenomenon known as stagflation, simultaneous high inflation and high unemployment. The stagflation problem had its roots in President Lyndon Johnson's stubbornness. In the late 1960s, against the strong advice of his economic advisors, Johnson increased expenditures on the Vietnam War but refused to cut spending on his Great Society social welfare programs. This refusal helped spawn a virulent demand-pull inflation. 